Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, so uh, this is supposed to be a mini course, so I'm going to uh, do a survey of, uh, of a few questions that I think are important for the basic principles of protein folding, and because of the limitation in time, I will mostly focus on my own work, but hopefully this would give you a perspective of what I think are important and how I'm looking at uh, various issues in protein folding. So uh, the first lecture is uh, funnels, cooperativity, resolution, and enthalpic barriers in protein folding. So here's a brief outline. So I'm first going to talk about cooperativity because ever since I uh, became an independent PI, uh, maybe 19 years ago, I, I was very interested in cooperativity because I think that uh, a lot of the existing model, maybe even including the atomic model, they are not insufficient to capture the experimental data on folding cooperativity. And by focusing on it, hopefully we can improve the model, also improve our conceptual understanding. So this would cover the physical meaning, historical context of, of cooperativity, relationship with the funnel picture, and the principle of minimal, minimal frustration that has been a figure quite prominent in this uh, workshop, and uh, Shefflin taught kinetics and so on. And then we'll talk about native topology using structure-based model to, mo uh, to see whether a uh, common gold-like model can capture the experimental uh, it determine uh, high degrees of folding cooperativity, and then we talk about the absorption barrier, and especially enthalpy and volume barriers and their implications to the final picture. Then we'll talk about this side chain denaturance effect. Is this uh, MTM is um, is an uh, acronym for molecular transfer model? So Dave Thurmai and his group build up a model like that that can actually. Uh, capture some of the effect of the nature independent that's quite useful. So we, we have also repeat some of these experiments, not exactly repeat, we have a model that's uh, more or less the same as his, but, but slightly different. Then at the end of the hour, we talk about transition path and confirmation of diffusion pictures of protein folding and some sort of simple simulations that we've done a number of years ago to look at, for example, you know, this Sabo formula for the transition path time, whether it's accurate and so on. Okay, so so our focus today and maybe for the next two lectures are on, not on big proteins, but on this uh, small single domain protein, two state like folding of small single domain proteins has been uh, quite useful for the, to the field ever since the discovery of CI2 uh, folding in a two state like manner. Oh, so what do I mean by folding cooperativity? So if you uh, imagine that certain coordinate like this, usually we use this uh, simple uh, progress variable Q, which is the fractional number of native contact, and you, you, you measure or you stimulate as a function of time if it's doing something like that. It's not cooperative. This is kind of cooperative because the high Q state is con considered a folded state, is unfolded state, and then it can be even more cooperative. So the experimental criteria, uh, historically, and still this is, uh, I, I think, is a, a very stringent condition, is to use calorimetry to measure when top over calorimetric enthalpy, if the ratio is approximately equal to one, we say that is two state light. And kinetically, this usually corresponds to a uh, chevron plot with uh, linear folding and folding arms. Now with, uh, with new techniques, uh, for example, like the beautiful work that uh, Michael Woodside talk about, maybe we'll talk about more uh, today, later, these single molecule experiments can actually directly observe this kind of behavior. Okay, so we all know about the uh, so-called Levinas paradox uh, is a golf course landscape, and you can, if, if basically what Levinas is saying is that if uh, protein folding is by a random search, you would never find a native state. And it seems that a lot of students, and we even most of the PI, thought that this is the gist of the Levinas paradox. And one point that I think is uh, sort of less appreciated is why Levinas was putting out this talking point. I learned about this many years ago uh, when I was at USSF. That's, that's before the days that you have a uh, journal online. I just flipped through the journal and found this paper by Robert Bowen. You know, it has been a field for a long time. He's really a historian of the field uh, with his own pers perspective, of course. And uh, so he talked about, uh, he was, I guess he was an assistant professor at that time, not sure, but he, he was listening to a, to a Levendale's lecture in 1968 in Stanford. And Levendale clearly stated that the reason why he this uh, so-called paradox or talking point is because of the discovery of two-state cooperativity two days earlier by uh, Namri and others in, uh, in, uh, using calorimetry. Okay, so if 
protein folding is really two state, one unfolded state, one folded state. If you push it to the limit, it's really a golf course landscape. That's why we have a paradox. It's not that he's sort of not smart enough to realize that you can have a funnel and then you won't have a problem. So it's not really a, a search pro problem per se, but it's a search problem in the context of experimental fact that protein folding is two state like. Okay, so if we understand this historical context, so it goes something like this, right? So, so you have calorimetry, uh, scanning calorimetry, so you, you get this. I'm, I'm going to talk about how people go from this to this, uh, uh, to this prediction or, or, or this determination that the distribution of enthalpy is V2 state-like. And then never now push it to like two quantum state and to sharply defined state, then you have this golf course. So if we understand that, then having a uh, a wide open funnel is really not a solution to Levinel paradox because the wide open funnel, this PMF, if you, this is, um, if you uh, translate it into a one dimensional distribution of, uh, of state, it is not sharply defined as two states. So uh, a wide open funnel is not a solution to Levinel paradox. A solution to Levinel paradox is to have some, so something like this symbolically, what, what I call a near Levinel land landscape. That means it, of course, has to be have some cover slope in this high-dimensional conformational space. Otherwise, we would have a search problem. But this slope doesn't have to be uh, that large. I mean, um, Swansea has uh, considered this long time ago in 1992, saying that very gradual slope would be sufficient to overcome this search problem. But we do need to have some sort of slope. But at the same time, the, the neck of this has to be quite narrow in order to have some kind of a two-state behavior, but of course it's a polymer, it's not two quantum state. You have always have some intermediate state in between, intermediate conformational state in between. The question is how sparsely populated they are. And according to the calorimetry measurement, they should be quite sparsely populated, at least for, for those small single domain protein or even bigger one, like ribonuclease, and those proteins are about 150 residues long that people measure around 1960, 66, 68, they should have a distribution of entropy looking something like this. Okay, so since this is a course, so we can talk uh, for the student, we will just go through how people arrive at that conclusion of two-state cooperativity. So this is a typical scan. It's a long time ago from a paper of review. So you increase the temperature, you measure the specific heat capacity at a certain point when the protein unfold, you have a peak. And from this peak, first you have to determine some sort of a baseline. This is sometimes also controversial, but for this well-behaved protein, it's less controversial. Sort of a uh, folded state baseline is unfolded state baseline, and this small difference is called the delta CP. Is the uh, heat capacity of unfolded state versus the folded state, and usually unfolded state, well, almost I think the unfolded state has a higher heat capacity because it's more exposure of hydrophobic residues to water, and you have. Exposure of hydrophobic residues to water because of this argument of you know this uh, small iceberg effect is going to increase heat capacity. Okay, so for cooperativity of, of unfolding, so after you draw the baseline, you can get the area under this curve, and the area under the curve is called the uh, calorimetric enthalpy. So it's really the enthalpy associated with the unfolding with the protein, and by this peak value. One can also determine another quantity called the Ventoff enthalpy, which is there's various definition of it, but the uh, so most straightforward definition is just this. So, so you get the peak value of the CP scan, and then you multiply it by Boltzmann constant and T square, where T is the absolute temperature at the peak value, square root, and then and then multiplied by two, this is defined as the Ventoff enthalpy. Okay, now let's go through why delta X Ventoff over delta X calorimetric are possibly equal to one will imply two state cooperativity. Okay, CP by definition is partial H partial T, uh, keeping P constant. So you'll, you want to get the area under the curve, you do an integration. Wow, this is by the fundamental theorem of calculus, it says H at a higher temperature minus H at a lower temperature. So it's just this thing. This is delta H calorimetric. Okay, now with this definition, the Ventoff enthalpy, this is defined at the transition midpoint at the peak of the heat capacity curve. So if 
is really too state like at the transition midpoint. So this would be the standard deviation of the distribution in H. <coughs> and two times that would span this whole range. So if this thing is equal to that thing, that means two times this, this range is equal to that range. The only way that it can happen is really like a two-state behavior is doing something like that. So in a situation where there's some intermediate, at, even at the transition midpoint, that the distribution of enthalpy is something like this, then you would have this delta H went off because that's going to give you two times the standard deviation would be narrower, would be just something like this, right? Divided by this would be less than one. So when delta H went off over delta H calorimetric approximately equal to one, we are pretty sure that at least at the trans transition midpoint is behaving in this two-state-like manner. Okay, this turned out to be related to a lot of the ideas that uh, people might not have realized when they were first proposed, like, for example, this uh, minimal frustration principle that uh, Peter Wolnitz and others talked about. And so, in their theory, they have this uh, folding temperature and glass transition temperature. And TF over TG is a measure of how, I mean, a bigger TF, TG means that it's more minimally frustrated. So in the beginning, based on some lattice model, they have an estimate of this is equal to 1.6, but I think now, by now, we understand Peter also, underst uh, also agree that it should be larger. I mean, it could be 3.5 in, I think, in a paper in 2014 that they, they stated that it could, uh, could be even bigger than 3.5. Okay, so this is one connection that I've made uh, in 2000 about the went off over calorimetric and TF over TG. The way that, uh, I approach it is through this uh, review by uh, Jose Oduchek and Peter Wolnitz in 1997. So they, they use a random energy model. It's kind of a toy model, but it's very useful to define this TF over TG. So you imagine a, dis a densi uh, density of states like this. So this is the um, native state energy, and this gap between the native state energy and sort of the average of the distribution of unfolded state is this small delta ES. And, uh, spread of the energy in the unfolded state is uh, determined, it is characterized by this big delta E. And TF over TG, according to uh, Jose and Peter, is given by this formula, where S0 is just the uh, KB times the log of the total number of conformational states, uh, conformations in the unfolded state. So what I was able to derive is that using the same model, delta X went off over the electric color metric, is actually equal to the square root of 1 minus 4 times Tg over Tf squared. Okay, so if you plug in some numbers, uh, typically for well-behaved two-state like protein, delta X went off over the electric chromatic is around 0.95. Then Tf over Tg should be around 6. And if it's lower, then, it's, then Tf over Tg, according to this formulation, is smaller. If it's higher, of course, it can be even higher. So here's just a rough sketch of, uh, this derivation is pretty simple, so I'm just going to uh, go through. Okay, so say if we have this random energy model, so the density of state, G of H, well, energy and enthalpy, I'm going to be a, a bit sloppy here, they are assuming that we're the same. Uh, later on, we're going to be a bit more serious about the distinction. Uh, okay, so it's equal to, I set the uh, native state energy at zero, so we have a delta function here, and then we have, this is the distribution of the unfolded state. And delta H went off is the defined to be the difference between the average energy of the unfolded state versus the native state, because native state energy is zero, so it's just given by this formula. And then you plug it into this, and then you do an integration, assuming that the the, the Gaussian is uh, pretty tight. You can extend this integration to minus infinity and get approximately get this value, where HD is basic is the difference between the native state energy and the and the mean value of the unfolded state energy. Okay, so we can also use this simple model to calculate the equilibrium constant. So it's just doing the, uh, because the the statistical weight for native state is just one because energy is zero and the Multiplicity is g is equal to one, so we basically just have this term, just uh, the statistical weight of the denatured state is given by this. Again, using the same trick, you integrate into this. So by setting this equal to one half, we get the 
transition temperature is given by this formula, sending this thing to one half, then you plug this in into, into this expression here, you get when topper parametric equal to this expression, and then by equating GD with the omega zero in Jose's uh, expression, you'll get the formula that I show you, which is uh, uh, this one. Okay, so that's uh, so much for thermodynamics, and for kinetics, uh, experimentalists usually characterize two state like folding by, by this uh, linear Schaeflin arm. So, so what is a Schaeflin plot? A Schaeflin plot is this uh, is um, is a plot of the relaxation rate, or sometimes the folding and unfolding rates, as a function of denaturing concentration. Originally, a Schaeflin plot looks something like this because they plot the folding time. The reason why it's called Schaeflin plot is Bob Matthew. He told me that this long time ago he was in the military, U.S. military, and then you have this Schaeflin, and so he thought this looked like the Schaeflin. But later on. The style change and it's all inverted now. It's all according to the rates instead of the folding time, so, so they now they look, look like they are V-shaped. And not all protein would have these linear arms for Schaeffelon plots. Some would have this roll over, especially on the folding side. It can happen on the unfolding side too, but we are not going to cover that. Uh, this usually indicates that some kind of folding intermediates and the folding kinetically is not that much two state. Okay, so one guiding principle of my research in the past is that this looks like sort of very mundane properties of protein folding. We all learn about it for, I mean, it has been around for 30 years, but remarkably, actually, a lot of models that we thought should be able to capture this, they can't. And exp because a lot of previous models, they, they, they didn't consider explicit chain. If you don't consider explicit chain and uh, actual sort of a, a, a self-contained polymer model, for example, people say that, oh, and for this day I calculate one way, for this day I calculate one way, but it's not uh, sort of a Hamiltonian covering everything. Then you think that you capture this behavior, but once you put in a self-contained polymer model, it's pretty difficult. And this difficulty actually can be an opportunity that we understand how proteins are evolved or how the amino acid and waters are interacting so that they can give rise to these remarkable properties. Okay, for instance, uh, this is a so a simplified atomic model proposed by uh, Anders Urbis group uh, a long time ago. So it is, uh, the backbone is almost contain all the atoms, uh, maybe, maybe except one hydrogen, but, uh, and then it also have directional, uh, directional hydrogen bonding and side-chain hydrophobic interaction. So this thing actually can fold to a three-hex bundle. But if you look at the underlying distribution of energy as a function of temperature, it's always unimodal from a low temperature to a high temperature. At the middle temperature, it's spread out a bit. So if you do the heat capacity, because heat capacity is Kb, 1 over Kb T squared times the variance of the distribution of energy, it would also have some sort of a peak. But it's not bimodal. So this model is not bimodal. And if you look at the kinetics, it has a severe Chevron rollover. So just being able to fold doesn't mean that the folding is cooperative. So how about this uh, gold light model? So, so this is a model that a lot of people use, including many in the room, uh, starting with um, uh, John, uh, John M. Shea with, um, uh, with Charlie Brooks and Jose, and, uh, and uh, a lot of work by Jose's group and also by Takata. So we're all familiar with this. And so definitely this thing can fold, especially for small single domain proteins. But is it good enough for cooperativity? And if we use that model to do a model Schaeffelon plot, they have rollovers. So they actually look like this case with Barnes. I mean, this is a model for CI, it doesn't look like this. So what it means, and uh, that was a surprise to us many years ago that even with this cheating gap potential or whatever you put in, you think that once we do that, we can capture all the kinetic behavior. You capture a lot of kinetic behavior. You learn a lot from these common, common goal line models. But in terms of the kinetics, it has this rollover. So it's not sufficient. Okay, this is just uh, saying what I just said. Okay, so we, we may be missing something. So uh, let's put in some general features that see whether we can improve the situation. So one thing is this uh, dissolvation barriers, because it has been known for a long time since uh, uh, Peck and Chenner, I think in 1977, that you simulate the potential of mean force in water, or you use, they use some kind of uh, rhythm theory, 
um, between two methanes, you have the potential mean force is something like that. So you have a barrier. This barrier is essentially because at some point you are going to create some sort of a vacuum in between uh, the two methane and it can accommodate water. So you're not yet gaining the value of interaction between the methane, but you are losing contact with water. So you get this bump and it's called the salvation barrier. And uh, so say and uh, Anhau Garcia has explored that, uh, how this would work. Uh, uh, quite early, I think in 1999, to the, in, a, in a study on pressure denaturation, and later on uh, Margaret Zhang and uh, An Hao and Jose proposed using this model. And other people have used this as well. This is one that's uh, typically used by uh, Charlie Brooks group. Uh, it doesn't have this second minimum. This second minimum uh, corresponds to having a water in between. It doesn't have this second minimum, but it does have a, that does have a bump. So it turns out that uh, with this feature, of the effective interaction between different parts of the protein, you can greatly enhance cooperativity. That's already been shown by, uh, by Margaret and uh, co-workers. And so we pick up on this idea and we look at, for example, like CI2. So this is the original common goal model. So we look something like that. So it's free energy. This is the fraction of native contact. We're all familiar with this. And one thing that actually people talk very little about, but I always found that as a problem, is the minimum here is only at 1.8 or 0.85. That means it's e even using the common goal model is very floppy, even at the native state. And I don't think that corresponds to what NMR people are measuring. But that, that's, that's, that's the situation. But if you put in the dissolution barrier, because it got this bump, it sort of tightened the thing. And so first, the barrier is much higher. This barrier corresponds to the how cooperative it is because that's the more two state, right? This is free energy is minus log of the distribution of state. So the higher barrier, that means you have fewer uh, conformational state in the intermediate range. First, it's more cooperative. And also at the same time, the folded state is more tightened up. And now if you do the Schaeffler plot, it's getting more linear. Of course, in the end, it all, all curve, but, but these are only hypothetical situation uh, because we can't really get it to be that stable for real protein. So if we cut off, say, this is zero denaturation, it, it could more or less capture the, the linear chevron plot behavior, but not yet all the way. OK, so one thing that we can compare the dissolution barrier type of model and the common goal model with our barrier is to look at this uh, wide diversity of folding rates first noted by uh, Plaxco and Baker and, uh, and Simons. And so I'm not going to talk about this relative contact order and so on. The main point is that for this small single domain protein, they are all within 100 residues long, but the, there's a huge diversity in folding rate, and it could cover six orders of magnitude. And relative contact order and other measures can actually capture that. Well, the question is whether our structure-based model can capture that. A few people have, a few groups have look into that. The first one is by uh, Takata in, uh, in Japan. And then uh, Jose has looked at it. We have also looked at it. So if you use the common, uh, common goal model without the dissolution barriers, it's something like this. You get this correlation between the simulated folding rate and the uh, experimental folding rate. You got a well, reasonable correlation, but the thing is, here you have six also of magnitude. Here you, at most, I think uh, Chichilius is, uh, is, is slightly better. You've got three or, uh, around three also of magnitude. The other are all, all within two or one also of magnitude. So we really cannot capture the whole diversity of folding rate across different protein. It's kind of the same problem uh, in not capturing the chevron behavior. Because chevron behavior means that it's linear. The experimental means it's linear. That means actually it's a huge diversity in folding rate depending on the denaturation concentration, but uh, this kind of model would always give you a rollover. That means it is, sorry, it is um, it's not capturing the whole diversity. Okay, now if we put in the dissolution barrier, like this one, then just look at the red data point. These blue data points are, are for uh, all atom simulation that I'm not going to get into. Uh, we can now cover more or less the same range. So this is actually making the model much more protein-like, and because it's so physically motivated, so we, s we, we believe that this is a, a feature that is uh, important in uh, understanding the uh, thermodynamics and kinetics of protein folding. 
So a uh, former postdoc of mine, who is uh, now an uh, associate professor in, uh, in Turkey, uh, who's in Kaya, took a closer look at that, uh, at, at this question a number of years ago. But he just uh, say you have this uh, Leonard Jones light potential, like in the common goal model. It just cut short it, it just cut it, and say that the attractive range of this potential doesn't extend beyond 1.2 the native distance. So it's just make it a short range interaction. It's just ad hoc, but just test out what would happen. So it just so happened that you, you, you do this because the average typical native C alpha, C alpha distance is around 6.4 angstrom, and 1.2 corresponds to correspond around 1.4 angstrom, which is the radius of a water molecule. So just by doing that, you are actually mimicking the desolvation barrier. Although it doesn't have the barrier, but maybe the row of the barrier is not so much of the bed of the bump, actually about zero, but is in narrowing the attractive range of the attractive interaction. That seems to be the message where we got from this study. Okay, so, so he looked at how many? 52 proteins. And then again, we look at this kind of correlation between a simulated folding rate and uh, experimental folding rate. Again, if we have the long range, that means you have this thing, then you can't cover the whole range. So, so it's always can't cover the whole range of diversity. But if you put this in, it more or less cover it, and if you actually make it even sharper so that the minimum is the same as before, then you basically capture the range. So it appears from this, I think it's pretty clear, that the uh, narrow range due to the salvation barrier is one factor that's an enhancing the folding cooperativity of proteins. So this is actually related to a, a, a studies that's pretty interesting because in the past, a lot of people say that homopolymer collapse, including us, homopolymer collapse is not, if the chain is flexible, is not first order light or not two state light. But if the chain is stiff, Dijan talked about this, the stiff, it can be two state light. But if it's flexible, it's not two state light. But a number of years ago, uh, Binder and Taylor and Paul found that if you make the attractive range of a homopolymer, even homopolymer is, is flexible, small enough, you can, you can make it into a, a two state light transition for core globular transition like this. Okay, so when, when uh, Hussein and I did our study, we, we compare our results with this. So this is a very interesting uh, finding. But physically, we asked whether that's possible. And if we use this factor, 0 0 0.05, which is from, uh, from uh, Taylor, Paul, and Binder's study, and multiply by this 6.4a. So say if we ask the question whether this is possible for a protein-like uh, homopolymer with say, within 100 residues, but it's a homopolymer, say a homo polyalanine, for example, to have core globular light transition. What is required for the narrowness of the range is like 0 0.3 angstrom. So I, I think physically, I don't know whether maybe you have a better idea. I don't know whether it's physically possible. It seems quite unlikely to have 0 0.3 angstrom narrow range of attraction, and beyond that is zero. So, so, so mathematically, this is possible. And maybe for other polymer, longer polymer is possible because if it's longer, maybe this would work out to be not 0.3, but for protein like homopolymer, probably this mechanism proposed by uh, Taylor Paul and Binder would not be applying. But, uh, but with a heteropolymer, of course, it's possible. But then the attractive ring would not be 0.3 angstrom, it's like this 1.4 angstrom that I just talked about. Okay, folding barriers. So we have these two pictures. This is so-called classical picture uh, with uh, basically a one-dimensional progress variable and theoretician try to capture that using the Q variable. And you know, always uh, for two-state light folder, you have a barrier. And this energy landscape picture where there is a higher dimensional conformational space, we just collapse into two dimension in a schematic way. And, and, and by the argument of Conformational search is to be something like a funnel. So there's a correspondence between this and that, and this this kind of landscape and this of uh, this kind of uh, traditional free energy profile. And so, what is this transition state? And this transition state would have entropic and enthalpic components. So the usual way of understanding it, I think, especially for students, 
uh, they would think that, okay, so we have this funnel-like picture and that it could be translated in this and this is mainly why do we have a barrier here and not a barrier here is because the conformation of entropy is decreasing faster than the gain in uh, attractive interaction. So, you're, so it's not fully compensated, so you end up with a barrier. But this is entirely true, but the, this is not the whole story. There's one point that maybe I'm not a theoretician in the past 20 years sort of missed. Is that if you look at the temperature dependence of folding, it's non arenaire so this is the data for CI2 from my uh, N first group, look something like this. So if you plot the delta H by using temperature dependence data of CI2, so this is a native state, the transition state, this is the denatured state. So you look something like this. It goes from denatured state, actually the enthalpy goes up and then comes down. So maybe it's not a funnel. Maybe it's really a volcano. Well, actually, I, I think some experimentalists felt that this is a an important issue, okay, so this is just more data along the same line. Almost all si single domain protein that have this typical non arenaceous behavior, and this is coming from the, I believe, I think that's true, is from the temperature dependent of hydrophobic effect. So you have this heat capacity effect or transition state. So for delta CP, it's a monotonic variation. For delta S, it's also a monotonic variation, but for delta H, is something like that. So is it really a volcano? So actually, I got hit by this. I don't know who this uh, anonymous referee is. I submitted a paper in 2003 to JMB, and I got this, uh, this report in which it says, a funnel-like landscape assumes mainly anthropic barriers. That's the conformational incomplete compensation that people usually talk about which is in contradiction to the experimental work that is displayed in table one, table one is my table. All of these experiments show major anthropic contribution to the free energy barriers. So I think this referee was trying to say is that if you actually know about the temperature dependence of the folding rate, which he assumed, maybe he's right, that a lot of theoreticians at that time were not quite aware of, at least it's not on the top of their consciousness, that you would find that the the final picture is untenable. That's, I think, what he's saying. Well, okay, so, so this is uh, a sigh, and uh, finally, I mean, got rejected in JMB, so I got it published in Proteins instead. Okay. But, but because motivated by this referee, I, I'm going to tackle this problem. Okay, so the first thing that I notice is that if you just simulate two methane or three methane using explicit water, uh, Potential of mean force, if you simulate a different temperature, you simulate a different temperature, this work of uh, Sabre, and Mark, uh, Maria, Markadam, and uh, Simishu and, and me. And then you can use this temperature variance to get the uh, anthropic and tropic contribution. You would find that there's always a barrier around the desolvation barrier, dB mean the desolvation barrier. This is around 1.8 kilo carry per mole, but this, the free energy barrier is only 0.5. So the anthropic barrier is always higher for this kind of association in water of hydrophobic residues, higher than the free energy barrier. So to do a more complete study, I had a collaboration with Pierre Tillerman in Calgary a number of years ago with, uh, with Justin uh, McCarman. I, I, now he's also a faculty member at, uh, at Calgary. Okay, so we are looking at two helices coming together. The helices are more or less fixed uh, internally. I mean, you can move a little bit, the side chains can move and then surround it with water and just calculate the potential mean force of these two helices. So we consider two pair, one is uh, a polyanonine, the other is polyleucine. Uh, each helix has uh, 20 residues. So here's the main result. Okay, so this black curve is the potential mean force. It does have a little bit of bump, but not that much. And for polyleucine, it doesn't even have a bump. I mean, for polyleucine, because the side chains are more free to move, it's just go all wash out. Okay, now if you look at the anthropic component of the free energy and anthropic component of free energy, the red one is an uh, anthropic component. Actually, high peak is high peak, and this peak, around 50 kilojoules per mole, is actually in the same awesome magnitude of what is found by experimentalists. But this peak is not going to give you a barrier in, uh, in, in the free energy or in the potential mean force, a huge barrier, except for this little bump, because it's compensated by a negative contribution uh, from the entropic component of the free energy. So we also look at heat capacity, but I'm not going to focus on that. So, so basically, it's a huge compensation. At, if you look at this 
uh, hacking of the two hits is uh, some sort of uh, transition state of folding, uh, some sort of uh, schematic model transition state of folding. At the transition state, there's a huge compensation between enthalpy and entropy. Okay, so we go come back to this question, is it really a funnel? So what are the coordinates? The coordinates of this multi-dimensional surface, I mean, it's pretty trivial. I mean, basically, we have a potential function, we just plot it out. We can plot it out in multiple dimensions, so we just schematically draw two, two axes and then didn't consider the other. But for protein, really, it's a potential mean force, so the thing that we are actually plotting is this exponential of this and then take a log outside. So this potential mean force is called potential mean force because you take a derivative of it, you get the average force with all the, the sorry, with all the solvent degrees of coordinate integrated out. Okay, so it's a potential mean force, so it's really the, the, the landscape should correspond to this black curve. Okay, so schematically what we got is that if we just rotate it to get a pretty picture, this is should be kind of the shape of the landscape for the for the coming together of these two helices. Yeah, it's right for the enthalpy, it looks like a volcano, but now with the entropic contribution, when this added up, it doesn't look like a volcano, it's still more or less a funnel with a little bit of bump. So this argument by the referee is not, wow, well, he didn't actually argue that the final picture is wrong, but he's sort of implying that. That's, that's not true. I mean, even with the observed, uh, the, the observed enthalpic barrier, if you understand it as some sort of a solvation effect, it can be all consistent with a final picture of folding. Okay, so let's look a little bit deeper into this. So what happened? So, so here are the polyalanine, polyleucine. So, so here, starting from when they are apart, You've got water in between. This red thing means uh, there's water population. At a certain point, you're co create, going to create some void in between, and finally they come together. So at this stage, con which corresponds to some sort of a transition state, the, the two helices are not touching each other. So they're not getting all the favor when you have interaction. But the waters are gone because we call it steric wetting because it's, uh, it's just not enough space there for, for water. So we are not even talking about China's idea of you know, huge dewetting. It's just the, the the gap in between is so small it cannot accommodate water. So you get some sort of void in between. And this is causing the anthropic barrier. But, but when you have void, that means all these interfacial waters are released to the bout. And when the interfacial water is released to the bout, it gains a lot of water entropy because the water at the interface are more ordered, at least for a hydrophobic surface. So this is the origin of the huge compensation between the water entropy because it released to the at this from the interface to the bout, and then the, you still have a not gain the when you have interaction between different parts of the helices. So, so you, you, you track this. So it's a delta H because we use an NPT simulation. You see that actually the enthalpy tracks very well with the volume of the system. So you actually also have an activation volume or a volume barrier. We're going to talk more about this on Wednesday. And the height of this is around 60 or so uh, milliliter per mole. And it just so happened, I asked Kathy Royer, and it so happens that this corresponds to a typical value for the volume barrier for protein folding that people could measure using pressure dependent uh, measurements. Okay, so um, uh, let's switch gear a little bit and talk about uh, side chain representation. So, uh, Dave Thurmalai and his group proposed a, a beautiful model a number of years ago. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's based on a, a representation like this. So it's basically a two-bit representation, one bit for the, for, for the C alpha, the other for the side chain. And the potential function is as a side chain goal model. And then he, he added a solvent accessible surface area, SASA based denaturant or osmolite concentration dependent transfer free energy is from experiment. So, so you can calculate what is the, the, the exposed area of the side chain and then you map it to the transfer, experimental transfer data and get some temperature, de uh, sorry, the dependence on denaturant concentration in the urea or guanidine. So this is uh, one of the papers and they, this is a simulated Schaeffern plot because in the, for the Schaeffern plot that I did before, uh, I use a proxy for 
for the denaturant concentration, basically using the stability of the protein thermodynamics, stability of the protein as a proxy. So this is maybe a bit more realistic, although mathematically they are quite equivalent. So I'm going to show you later. Uh, they actually got a denaturant concentration that is coming from experimental transfer free energy. So this look, the, the agreement uh, are not reasonable. This is for a SAC XX3 domain. Okay, so, so this is just uh, more background for, for the student. What is uh, Sasha is a solvent sample surface area. Basically, you have this group of our molecules, and then you use this sphere, which is, uh, which is models of water, with uh, water molecules with a radius of 1.4 angstrom. You just roll this ball on the surface, and the center of this sphere trace out a surface, and that's called a solvent accessible surface. And you can also define another surface, it's called a molecular surface, and that's actually that's traced out by the surface or by uh, molecules, and this also this B entrance surface. But basically we are we are just uh, focusing on uh, SASA uh, today. Okay, so we compare a whole bunch of models on this uh, protein L, and this is what we found. Uh, so again, we're plotting out the free energy profile as a function of Q, so this is the common goal model, so the barrier is pretty low. And then now if we put in the, uh, this side chain goal model, so we, we also have our own side chain goal model similar to uh, the external mind. It's basically the same, there's a, a few tiny things that are just because of history, we just got it a bit different. And also this side chain model with the guanidine chloride uh, dependence. So these are higher, so definitely with this side chain model you're getting more cooperativity because the barrier in between is higher. If you have the dissolvation barrier as well, or just have the dissolvation barrier, the dissolvation barrier actually is, is even more cooperative. So even these things are not as cooperative as those models with the dissolvation barrier. So one thing that is interesting, I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, is that we, you can look at the, the, the fluctuation of the native state in these various kinds of models. So for the C alpha model, you, you know, the, the minimum is here at not even 0.8. So you know that it's pretty floppy. And actually the side chain model has the same problem too, if you call it a problem. I think it's kind of a problem. Uh, so, so these are pretty floppy. It's only a dissolvation barrier model would, would, would tighten it up. Uh, so experimentally, I think this can be determined. Uh, but uh, uh, even for simulation, there's a big variation in atomic simulation. Uh, David Shaw's some proteins is pretty tight, the women's square deviation uh, for the for the native state within one angstrom, but in some other cases, in lambda repressors can be four angstrom or more. It doesn't mean that these are correct numbers because I believe there's still some problem with the, with, with the, with the force field that are used in this explicit water or atom simulation as later they admitted that they, uh, when, when you apply it to intrinsically disordered protein, they don't give the right dimension. And so I think there's a various effort these days to try to uh, improve on the force fields. Okay, so so this is our own data on protein L using this model, which is pretty similar to the thermalized. Uh, so, so now we have Schreffron plot. And this, all this Schreffron plot has some sort of a rollover. This is a huge rollover. This is for the common goal model. So definitely, it's not capturing the, the experimental data, which is this uh, flat line for, for the protein L. The other are better. This is uh, only a mild rollover um, is this one. But still, it doesn't for exactly on this line. So, so with this side chain, we are doing better, but I think we should still work harder to try to capture what is the, what is the thing that is missing. And the thing that is missing, that actually I think is a challenge to us, I actually mentioned this to Dave, and uh, I think he's working on this too, is that for all this model Schaffron plot, we always get some sort of a, a, a symmetric one. But the experimental Schaffron plot, they're seldom symmetric. Usually, the slope of this is two times as that. Actually, Bob Matthews noticed that, and he asked me to whether I, I could do something. I've been thinking about this for a long time, but I don't have enough people to, uh, to address this. I have some idea, but I, I told Dave he's going to address this as well. I think, actually, if, again, this is, seems to be a very mundane property, but if we understand how to actually make this into this in a physically reasonable way, I think we'd gain a lot of understanding of uh, protein folding. Okay, so what is the origin of that uh, slight Schaffron rollover, even with this um, uh, side chain 
the nature independence model is, is the behavior like this, the certain fluctuation, this kind of thing. So it's not as cooperative as the real protein. It, it forms this thing and then, un, and, and then it just breaks up and then try again, try again. So, so this may be the kind of thing that people call on pathway in the medics. It's like a, um, like a model that uh, Vijay Pandey looked at uh, many years ago in his 48 MERS. Uh, uh, Pande and Rockshaw, they, they say that there's on pathway in the mediate. Later on, we also look at the same model in this paper in 2003 and found that these things are, yeah, they're on pathway because it's a goal model, but it's due to some kind of a difficulty for the chain to reorganize itself even within a goal model context. So you have this sort of thing that's giving rise to the Chevron rollover. So, for example, this 48 mer has a Chevron rollover, and uh, uh, VJ interpreted it as an as a on pathway intermediate. But Say for protein L, this thing probably uh, something that actually we have to overcome. This, this kind of prediction show that it's not, there's still some feature that is not totally consistent with experimental observation because it's precisely this sort of thing that gives rise to this slight Chevron rollover. Okay, so diffusion pictures of protein folding. This, this is the work that I done uh, several years ago, so maybe a, a bit dated. Uh, we didn't take into consideration the recent work of Michael, but maybe hopefully this would stimulate some uh, discussion. Okay, so, so these are Bill Eaton's uh, data showing what is a transition path. You know, you, you get a trace of this, so this tiny bit. Uh, usually it's not, not doing much, either in the focus day and unfocus day, and all of a sudden it's sort of passed over the barrier. And in principle, this is all the interesting stuff is happening there because you go from the forest day to the forest day, you can look at the sequence of events. And what have been measured is that the folding time, for example, for these two protein, WW domain and GB1 measured by Bill Eaton, folding times can be uh, 10,000 times apart, but the transition path times, how long this thing is, is only within a factor of five. And there's uh, a Tila Sabo as a formula for that, but interestingly, there's no reference to Attila himself on this. It seems that Attila just freely gave this formula to Bill and Bill said it somewhere. So this uh, the Asabu formula is actually you reference it to a, to a pa paper by Bill Eaton. It, it's given by in this form. So, so it's dependence on the, later on I'm going to show you that the dependence on the barrier height is much weaker than the, than the dependence of the folding time the, or, the, or the folding rate on the barrier height because the folding time or the folding rate depends exponentially on the barrier height, but the uh, uh, FH transition path time, according to uh, the Sabu formula, only depends logarithmically, not even so linearly, logarithmically with the barrier height. Okay, I said this already. Okay, so we can, uh, we can turn on uh, this kind of crank of uh, our model, and uh, this is a model with desolvation barrier just to make it more more cooperative, more protein-like. So we can get our transition path in this part. You, you, you blow it up, it looks something like that. First, we test that there's no correlation, at least in this set of model, between uh, the transition path time and the first passage time. Okay, one thing that I've been always interested, it's pedagogically, maybe it's good for, for students to, maybe it's trivial, but, but I always have, have, have a question is in this, uh, transition state picture, we, we sort of have this uh, impression that on this side, before, before it, uh, the system actually passed through the barrier, is a pre-equilibrium that obey the Boltzmann distribution. And then, so that's why you have this factor, this uh, WG double dagger, and then, then at that point, then some of this would go over on the other side. So, so I'm just curious whether Oh, I'm sorry, I, I think there's something wrong with the, because of the, the Apple uh, system. But, but anyway, so, so, so we, we, we simulate that. So, so this is the, for, for our, a model for CI2. So this is the equilibrium free energy profile. Then we can also look at the folding kinetic profile. That means we basically get a, a path that would just fold and then we stop. And we, look, we take a log of that and look at how it fit into the unfolded part of it. So most of it actually, there's a pre-equilibrium because actually it goes through a lot of times before it would fall. But on the top of the barrier, there's some deviation. So, so it's this. So this is basically just pedagogical. I just want to see how 
whether the picture is really correct. So it's some, some appreciable deviation from p equilibrium, but, but mainly it's a p equilibrium. You, you have this, the, the kinetic path, the log of the kinetic path population coincide more or less with the uh, some dynamic one. Okay, so we also want to look at this simple one-dimensional diffusion uh, equation, where how, how well can it uh, capture this, um, uh, this these various features of folding. So we, um, we simulated the diffusion equation using Monte Carlo. So we can either use Monte Carlo Metropolis algorithm, the one that we are familiar with, of this so-called Kawasaki algorithm that we actually used a one-half exponential. The Metropolis doesn't exactly correspond to the diffusion equation, although it's very close. Um, but the Kawasaki algorithm you can show actually is in, 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 the, in the supporting information of this paper that I show that this is just a discretized version of the diffusion equation. So you use this, is is exact, almost exact, I mean, this discretized version of the diffusion equation. So this is basically using this, is actually testing this. And A is just some arbitrary constant that you, you use it to scale the, the time unit. Okay, so here is the explicit chain simulation of the mean first passage time. And here is using this. So it's using the free energy profile from the explicit chain simulation, but now we are not doing explicit chain. The free energy profile is from explicit chain simulation, but once you have the free energy profile, we use this um, Monte Carlo to simulate the diffusion on this free energy profile. And they agree very well, both the using Metropolis or using the correct Kawasaki, they all agree very well. Okay, so this is a picture. So the free energy profile is from the exact simula uh, from the from the explicit chain simulation, and then we we use this Monte Carlo to simulate how to to ask the question how well are this uh, common picture of diffusion with a constant diffusion coefficient now. Uh, it's not Q dependence. Tomorrow I'm going to talk about Q dependence. Can capture the features of uh, folding. Okay, so this is I think is kind of interesting. It's a test of the Sabo formula. Okay, so what is this? Here, this is the explicit chain simulator transition path time. And so, so for each of those, there's eight proteins that we model. There's the black point correspond to the Sabo formula. We plot it against this expression in the Sabo formula. And the other one, the red point corresponds to what we use uh, non explicit chain Monte Carlo simulation on the free energy profile. Okay, so this is remarkably good for the red point. So, so these actually are the simulation that I just explained to you using the, the Kawasaki dynamics. So, co correlation coefficient is 0.94. The sample formula is pretty good, but it's not as good, it's only 0.78. Apparently, because the barriers are not so high and the, the feature of the entire free energy profile is contributing to the transition path time. So the cyber form is derived, I believe, it depending on certain assumption about the curvature of the barrier and so on. So in general, it would have some deviation. And for Kramer's theory, the deviation is very little because the barrier is very high and then it's, it depends exponentially because this is depends only on the log of the free energy barrier some deviation is expected, but if we actually get the free energy profile itself and explicitly do the diffu one dimensional diffusion simulation, it can be pretty close. So this is, this is the message here. And we also look at the distribution and uh, distribution of the, so the red points are the explicit chain simulation for the distribution of transition path time. And the blue and the green points are those simulated again using the Monte Carlo, either Metropolis or Kawasaki, they agree very well. So the message is if you get the free energy profile, you can use this one dimensional diffusion, even just with a uh, uh, constant diffusion coefficient that doesn't depend on the, on the Q value, you can capture at least for this uh, two state light folder that connects pretty well. Okay, another thing that we found, I don't know whether it is general because now we look at more proteins, it seems that maybe it's not that general, but, but we look at, we compare the distribution of contact in the transition path time and those just in the unfolded ensemble. 
And so we can take a ratio of this, like the contact order in the transition path and the contact order of this folding path, folding path including all these things before it folds. And in most of, in, this is seven of the eight proteins that we studied in, in 2012. It turns out that the transition path have slightly higher contact order. So it seems that it, in order for the path to be successful, it, the, the ends should come together more than a typical one. So this coincides with some idea like by uh, Elisa Ha in uh, Israel about the uh, ends coming together being very important for folding. But uh, I mean, this is very suggestive, but uh, well we should have to, I think we should even do more tests to see how general this is and how much it depends on maybe topology and so on. Okay, so, so here it says for the eight proteins that we, uh, we look at, so most of them actually, you know, you see this ratio is larger than one, but in some cases, uh, it, it can be smaller. So, but something to think about. Okay, so this is my final result slide. So this is something that I already noticed and asked this question when, when we did this in 2012 is that, okay, because there's a lot of study using uh, correlate dependent diffusion coefficient to try to fit data for different proteins. So those, we learn a lot from that, but I'm asking whether we can, we give up a little bit of accuracy in the fitting, but actually we ask a sort of a more basic physical question, is there a diffusion coefficient that is more or less constant even across different proteins that would more or less give rise to the properties that at least you can get from explicit change simulation that's more real. I mean, hopefully we, that would also account for data that's from experiment, but now we are sort of comparing explicit change simulation with this one-dimensional uh, diffusion picture with a constant diffusion coefficient independent of Q and also even independent of protein. It turns out that, as I showed you before, they did pretty well. And the way that we did the diffusion process is that the formation of one contact or breaking of one contact has the same rate. So that's the basic diffusion coefficient. But if you actually think about, usually Q is supposed to be normalized, right? If you normalize Q for different protein, actually, if you have a one unit of Q different, it corresponds to different number of contacts form or unform. And if you use the latter one, that means you normalize Q first and then say you have a Q, you always take a step of Q is to one over 80, then you get this thing. You don't get much of a correlation. So the fundamental thing seems to be the forming and unforming of contact. Here, this Q, Q to N is the number of native contacts. So if we make the step that means we make the unit for the diffusion coefficient correspond to one contact forming or unformal contact or, or a fraction of it. There seem to be some sort of a baseline rate. That means even if the free energy profile is flat there, that you have this, free, this baseline rate that would account for folding behavior across different proteins. Well, this is kind of preliminary, but I think there's something interesting maybe uh, you guys want to comment on or think about. Okay, so here's a summary of what I talk about today. The Leavitt paradox is put forth and therefore should be understood and resolved or addressed in the context of folding cooperativity. It's not just a matter of uh, random or non-random search so that you can solve by a funnel. The funnel, there's a demand on the shape of the funnel too because it has to, sep it has to satisfy the condition of cooperativity. Okay, so cooperativity should be used as a uh, modern constraints so that I, I hope I've convinced you that just with this criterion we, we, we learn a, a little bit more about protein folding by looking at different models. So the salvation barrier is obviously for the physics of water salvation and from our simulation it's clear that it contributes a lot to, uh, to the cooperative, cooperativity of protein folding and also it would account for the enthalpy and one metric barriers to folding as well, and this would solve, we solve this puzzle raised by the referee and maybe by many experimentary, uh, experimentalists uh, many years ago whether the anthropic barrier to folding folding is inconsistent with the final picture. And the volume barrier I'm going to talk more about uh, on, uh, on Wednesday. 
And the transition path times are much more sensitive to the shape of the entire free energy profile. So the sample formula where it's very useful, but, but the deviation there would be substantial deviation if the shape is not in the ideal shape of some sort of parabola, it's assumed in the derivation. And this is the point that I just uh, put forth that seems to be approximate the constant baseline diffusion rate based on the forming or unforming of contact, but not on the normalized uh, uh, Q coordinates. Okay, so uh, thanks for your attention. So these are my coworkers. Oh, exactly on time. <laughs>